I'm Charles Hallisay. I'm here. I teach here on the faculty at Harvard Divinity School. And we are going to continue in this panel our effort to become coeval with ourselves by highlighting how the, inheritance of the inheritances of the past, both religious and scholarly, condition our present, and how the challenges of the future already inflict, inflect and inflict our present, both religious and scholarly. We're going to turn to two, traditions of, two religious traditions from South Asia, uh, the complicated religious tradition of Hinduism, which maybe we should say in the plural always, and then also Jainism. John Graham, in opening our sessions, comment, alluded to Confucius and commented on the pleasures of welcoming old friends from afar. Uh, people's conversation in the break is indicating some of that pleasure. But it's a distinct pleasure for me to be able to welcome two old friends from afar. Uh, we're starting late, and so I'm not going to uh, spend much time introducing them, to leave, the to leave it to you to look at their biographies on the Dropbox. If, we, if I began to read all 20 books that Chris Chappell, the titles of the 20 books that Chris Chappell has published, uh, there would be no time for him to speak. And so what, what we want to do is to turn it over to them. But let me just briefly say that it's Christopher Key Chappell who will speak first on Jainism. And Chris is the Doshi Professor of Indic and Comparative Theology at Loyola Marymount University. He's also the director of a Master of Arts program in yoga studies there. And then David Haberman, is a professor of religious studies at Indiana University, and he will speak second and will be speaking on the religious traditions of uh, Hinduism in South Asia. So, Chris. I'm of that age where this ancestor thing begins to take on sort of creepy relevance. <laughs> And I want to point out that John and Mary Evelyn and myself were in Sanskrit together 40 years ago, and that uh, Professor Neville here gave me my first teaching job 36 years ago. And I was invited to a party at his house, and I was very, I was 25 years old. I had acne, I was so young, and <laughs> thankfully I grew into being come, becoming a theologian. But he asked me, well, what's your next project? As only Bob Neville can say, so friendly, but so intimidating. <laughs> and I had done theories of will in Hindu and Buddhist thought for my PhD. And it was the summer of Three Mile Island, if you recall. And we were in the midst of fighting the Shoreham nuclear power plant on Long Island. And I said, I and I just made it up. But thank you, Bob, uh, because it eventually became a, a, a book um, from a conference 25 years ago called Ecological Prospects, Scientific, Religious, and Aesthetic Perspectives. Luca was part of this volume. And when I threw myself headlong into nonviolence vis-a-vis -vis nature, immediately, I landed into the religion called Jainism. I had the good fortune of inviting Pabhinav Jaini from Berkeley to come to Stony Brook. And he actually stayed at my humble home on the South Shore and told me that, having already argued down Janet Gyatso, okay, because Janet gave the Buddhist argument against Jainism, which was that, well, these Jains, they just care about themselves. And he said, well, say what you will, but you have to meet these people. So some time later, with support from my new university in California, I went and I met these people. Remarkable, utterly remarkable. And just as Muhammad urged us to challenge our students to get out of their stuck worldview, whatever it may be, so also I have been repeatedly challenged. And I traveled through India in 1989, visiting these Jain leaders in the north, in the middle, and in the south. And I asked again and again, Jain, nonviolence, environmentalism. And by that time, Bhopal had happened. By that time, the Center for Science and Environment began disseminating 
important information all throughout the subcontinent. By that time, MC Mehta had already begun his eventual successful campaigns to save the Taj Mahal, to stop the motor rickshaws from polluting so severely, of working toward the liberation of children from um, sordid industrial tasks. And I sat with a sage called Acharya Tulsi, who had been an advisor to Mahatma Gandhi, an elderly religious leader who had been in charge of what grew to be the largest order of Jain monks and nuns. He'd been in that position for some almost 60 years. And he answered me very simply, and he answered me very directly. And he said, this is all I have. This is the solution. And he indicated that his radical, the one that Janet was like, what are these people doing? And if you look at you know, early Buddhism, it was like, those people are just a little bit too strict. And if we look at the repeated Hindu condemnations of, of Jainism, and I'll talk a little bit about that, um, how, why, where, and when, but what we discover is that we need that radical edge. We need someone to be an inspiration by what they can do that takes that courage we heard about a few minutes ago. And the courage of a Jain monk or a Jain nun, of which there have always been three times as many nuns as monks, the world's oldest religious orders, hands down, okay, intact, for 2,800 years, and they take as final vows, never again, alighting in any artificial mode of conveyance. No automobile, no bicycle, nothing other than the foot, and the foot remains discalced, using Christian monastic language, but never again will they own a pair of shoes. Twice yearly, they spend a day removing, it wouldn't be hard for me, but for some, it would be very, very difficult. But they remove their hair, and as written by Satish Kumar, the head of Schumacher College in England, who'd been a monk for nine years, abundant, age of nine, took his vows, and he would carefully braid that hair and then tie it to his leg. And then only after all of the lice had hatched and flown away and fed on his body, would he let the hair fall to the ground. For the Svetambaras, only one set of clothing. And for the Digambara monks, no clothing whatsoever. These people have minimal impact. These people are the ultimate anti-consumers. <coughs> and how can we respond to that challenge? There are so many different ways. And if we think of resource, we think of the 50% of our immense medical expenditures eaten up in the last six months of life, and we think of the tremendous quantities of medical waste generated, what I'm going to say is really harsh, but it's also been instructive to me personally in family decisions and decisions made by friends, but prolongation of life. For them, there is no death. Part of the cosmology, which is a fascinating and very detailed cosmology, is that no, you don't die. You just immediately, as your breath departs, you have already determined, because of the life you've lived, exactly where you are headed. So don't fear death. And they have a process of salekana, which is a welcoming of death, that minimizes so much of the agony that we encounter in our convoluted Naming of death is an evil. Okay? It's inevitable. It's inevitable. So my next project 
having written about and um, you know the Jane, oh the other thing I, I do have to put this in they're about 0.4 percent of the population of India which means they're somewhere between four and six million they're not eager to self-disclose partly because they're very wealthy and they are responsible for reportedly 25 percent of the government coffers and tax money and uh, they also were the ones that first advocated for women. There's this wonderful temple in Hastinapur, and there is this, it's called the Ashtapad Mandir, and it depicts a family of 106 people, 100 sons, the patriarch, his two daughters, and his two sons, and his wife. One daughter invented mathematics, and the other daughter invented the alphabet and invented the science of reading. Her dad is the one who invented government and invented agriculture and invented marriage and invented religion. And then he went off to practice this religion he invented, so he had to go take his hair out and leave behind everything, eventually give up his clothes. But what happened was, um, very first person that became liberated from all the concerns of life that we hear about from the Buddhists and by the Hindus, many of them, and by the Jains, was his mom. And it was the woman who forged the path of what it can mean to actually be in that place that Muhammad talked about, that place of eternal awareness. And they say that you don't, even when you're free of rebirth, you're still vibrating with energy, consciousness, and bliss. And if you have the good fortune of visiting a Jain temple, I encourage you to do so. Beautiful, beautiful temple in Buena Park, California. Uh, when I first <coughs> entered this field, there was only one. And it was here in Boston. And I visited it. And it was an old Baptist church that had been converted out in the countryside. And now there are 65 and counting. And what they do, it's a little bit like, like we can't go there if you're not, but if you were able to go into, and it, actually it's prettier, but before they dedicate them, you know, in Mormon temple, you go into the upper room, and then you get to hang out in heaven for a while. And when and boys go there when they're 11, and girls don't get to go there until they get married to one of those boys. That's a whole other story, but this is what a temple's supposed to do. It's supposed to bring you into that place of serenity, and it's just wonderful. And it's not as the Hindus would have it, necessarily world-denying. It's not as the Buddhists actually held to, and this is one of the reasons why the Buddhists didn't really last. It's not the case that to be a good Jain, you have to be a monk or a nun. And it's also um, interesting to really think of their willingness to constantly reinvent themselves. Okay, Hava mentioned vegetarianism uh, a little bit ago. And some, probably 2,500 years ago, they really figured out with the pulses that most likely came in from Ethiopia, they really figured out, combined with some milk, how to engineer a healthy diet that is purely vegetarian. More recently, um, a Jane from North Carolina, Pravin Kesha, has become the great evangelist for veganism in the Jane community because there's certain difficulties with dairy products. And they're switching their thoughts around on that. And as I mentioned before, they are significant industrialists in India. They, their businesses are worth very, very large revenue for the people and for the government. And they are going headlong into solar production. And this is one of the things that I hope to do when I return for a visit again. So I wanted to lay out some of the contours and look forward to your questions uh, during our discussion period in a few minutes. Thank you.
Okay, well, good afternoon. I um, wanted to begin by just expressing my gratitude for uh, the invitation to be part of this great gathering. Um, I was part of the initial, some of the initial conferences and have uh, been involved in some of the activities of the Forum on Religion and Ecology over the years and just uh, want to celebrate what a wonderful presence that is in the academy but in my own personal life also. Uh, I told my wife that I wanted to come to, she asked, why, I postponed a trip to India just to be here. And she asked kind of why it was important to me. And I said, because this is, this is a gathering of my sangha. Uh, this, this is kind of my tribe in the academy. And uh, as I say, I'm, I'm very pleased to, to uh, be here. Um, I think we all understood our assignment in, in very, very different ways. Um, uh, that, that was a wonderful narrative, Chris, in, in ways. I think that would be difficult for me to do with Hinduism, because Hinduism is such a pluralistic tradition. Um, but I guess I took my assignment uh, as uh, talking about the paper in some sense that is posted. And I'm assuming that some, it's kind of like going before a class, some did the reading, some didn't do the reading. <laughs> some, some had access to the materials and others didn't. And, and so let me see if I can find some kind of middle point in all that. Um, but my task, as I understood it, was to address uh, the subject of Hinduism and ecology, the study of that, and uh, to reflect on three points. One, where we have come from in uh, the last couple of decades, and uh, where we are going, and what challenges lie ahead. So let me just uh, move through those points, again, referring to the paper, but um, the details you can find there. Um, Hinduism and ecology isn't really a big field, I would say even today, but uh, was introduced in significant ways uh, in the 1990s. And one sign of that was certainly the publication of the uh, volume on Hinduism and ecology that came out of the conferences here at the uh, Center for the Study of World Religions. Uh, besides that, just prior to that, a uh, volume came out uh, that was edited by Lance Nelson called Purifying the Earthly Body of God, which I think also was a kind of an introductory piece. The early work in the field tended to be focused primarily on texts and have an interest in uh, philosophical issues. And um, one of the early questions, and I think this is part of the legacy of Lynn White, was to ask a question of really every tradition, is it eco-friendly or not? And in some sense, I think those of us who work with traditions laugh at the ridiculous nature of that question because we understand there is no such thing as Hinduism. There are only Hinduisms, and that's true of every tradition that any of us study. Um, nonetheless, it was asked and was answered uh, in a large degree in a, in a negative fashion. That is, that, that although Taoism and Buddhism and Native American religions were eco-friendly, Hinduism was not. I think the primary reason for that is, and it continues to trouble me, the dominance of the philosophical system known as uh, Advaita Vedanta in the representation of Hinduism, particularly in the Western Academy. And um, rather than representing that philosophical tradition as one fascinating philosophical tradition amongst many, it was represented often as the Hindu philosophical system. And it is uh, a system that informs the tradition of world renunciation, and it, it's an ascetic uh, justification of a religious life. Um, I think many of us working in the field of Hindu studies try so hard to, to uh, move beyond that limited uh, factor. Bob Orsi was a colleague of mine at uh, Indiana for a while. And he told me one time, David, just give up. You're never gonna, you're never gonna free the study of Hinduism from that. And I think it was in a dark moment because in some sense, the question is, is there presence in the non-human world? Um, or in Sanskrit languages, is the jagat sat? Is the world real or not? Is it, is, does it really exist? Uh, and I think to ask the question, is there a presence 
in the world? Is there a presence in the non-human world? Is an interesting way of putting that question. And I think it's, it pertains to much of the work that we all do. Well, for those of you who follow work of Bob Orsi, you know that he just published a book with that uh, word in the, in the title. So I don't think he himself has given up. That led, however, to people saying things such as that um, Hinduism could only be an ecological tradition to the degree that it frees itself from uh, this understanding that life is an illusion that is to be escaped. There's that moksha concept. And that, that was the dominant view of Hinduism, the, the understanding the world's an illusion. Although that is fair for a particular kind of Hinduism, I would say it's not at all fair for the great majority of Hinduism. And to me, one of the tragedies in uh, the Orientalist construction of Hinduism is, this, um, is the missing of the fact that the, that the main, dominant, most popular forms of Hinduism are very life-affirming. Um, I think that uh, my colleague Chris Chappell's work is, uh, however, uh, a good counter to that, because I think Chris, as we just heard, wants to dig into those world-renouncing traditions, if, if it's fair to call them that, or as he would call it, renouncer values. Uh, such as uh, nonviolence and minimal consumption, and look at how they have something positive to offer uh, environmental considerations. So as important as that is, uh, others, and I think this is one of the major developments in, in the academic study of religion and ecology, have shifted towards uh, Vasudha Narayan, I can name lots of names, uh, have made that shift, um, towards looking at more the bhakti devotional cultures. I would say that my own work would be following in that particular line. I think this often means um, looking at um, what I would call worshipful interaction with embodied forms of divinity. Um, that is, uh, looking at conceptions of natural entities as those full presences, maybe to bring that word back into that. And to look at the embodied uh, modes of religious practice that, uh, that uh, are concomitant with those conceptions of natural entities. So paying more attention to those. In my own work, I've done studies of sacred rivers and uh, sacred landscapes and trees and now working on uh, mountains and stones and, and such issues. Since we're uh, at the home institution of Diana Eck, and I was looking around, I don't think, is Diana here? I think she'll be joining us later. But I want to just give a shout of praise to her work. I think she made major um, contributions toward uh, giving more attention to sacred landscapes, uh, embodied practices, pilgrimage activity, uh, those sorts of things. And uh, she wrote that gem of a book, Darshan, that, that uh, I think has had great, great positive repercussions in the study. And then her latest um, magnum opus, the uh, India Sacred Geography. So I guess I want to uh, acknowledge uh, the great contribution that Diane Eck has, has made towards all this. I would say that in addition to shifting towards bhakti, we've seen much more work being done in ethnography, um, field work being done there. And I think this, this has been a corrective and something that complicates just the textual studies. So, for example, uh, Kelly Ellie's book on the Bank of the Ganges, I think, uh, adds to and complicates Diana Eck's own work on the Ganges, which was primarily textual in, in her representation of that. Um, I, could, I could mention many, many more, um, right up to the most recent one that I'm aware of is uh, Udi Halperin's article that just came out in JAR on uh, climate change issues in the Western Himalayas. Um, fascinating article. So ethnographic work, that again, again, having those conversations, visiting the sites where this worshipful interaction with embodied forms of divinity actually take place. Well, what remains to be done? I could just say lots. <laughs> there, there's so much. I think we are a new field. We're still, I was curious to hear John say that we're still an emerging field. Uh, I don't know when we make it there, but, but still an emerging field. And I suppose that, that's true in so many ways. Um, my own sense is that we need to continue examining those uh, embodied forms of, of Hinduism, bodily interaction with embodied forms of divinity, and to struggle those, to uh, continue the efforts to free ourselves 
um, from what I would still say is the iron grip of idolatry. Um, Frederick made reference to uh, a lot of what happened in the 16th and 17th centuries. I think Muhammad referred also to that critical century, the 17th century, and once our science is locked in. Well, the issue, the, the, what, what was it that was being fought about in the 16th century? It was idolatry. And um, I, I just think that we need to continue to think about that. That's fair enough for that to be a judgmental term within a particular religious tradition, but um, it, it has functioned in a manner in the comparative study of religion where it, it has determined our interpretive lenses to a large degree. And I think a lot of the work that's been going, going on today in the field of religion and ecology and many other fields is to question many of the assumptions we've inherited through modernity. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a lot of the work that we need to do, to take uh, in my own project, how do, how do I think about the concept of presence in a sacred rock or a sacred mountain? Mm -hmm. I think those continue to be some of the challenges and how we represent that in our translative work um, that we produce for others. Um, yeah, and I think in many ways Hinduism presents a major challenge to those um, modern, uh, modernist assumptions that uh, are connected with the idea of, of idolatry. Mark was talking about animism. Well, um, there, there's been uh, Bird David's article on animism uh, revisited or reconsidered, right? And we've reconsidered so many things. Paganism is a term that some identify with. The core issue in all that for me uh, is idolatry and say something I think is worthy of considering and the place of that in our work. Um, we also uh, would say need to continue to look for those balance points. India is the uh, subcontinent that uh, gave birth to the middle way, <laughs> expressed in so many ways. And I think one of the middle ways that I have in mind here is to see a tradition as too eco-friendly, over-romanticizing a tradition, losing a lot of the complexity, but I think that's one danger. On the other hand is the opposite, and that is to dismiss the tradition as having any values to offer as resources to um, address the environmental issues today. Um, so how, how to think about that in, in um, particularly in, in complex ways. Um, there's an immense difference between the traditions that we study and the kinds of challenges that we are, are meeting today. The environmental crises at the level we're facing is historically unprecedented for our species. And I take that very seriously in thinking about religion. Um, religion is always changing and addressing the particular historical challenges of its day. And I would say, to me, the biggest challenge is the environmental um, crisis and, and how that, we're going to address that. Um, so no, no religion in its current state is really prepared, ultimately. But I think all of them are moving in that direction. All right. Um, well, time goes quickly. Let me just move to... Um, future challenges, what lies ahead? And for me, the question in thinking about that was for whom? Am I talking about scholars of religion or are we talking about um, Hindu practitioners? And maybe to, to shift, I'll say a little bit about, about scholars and um, some of the issues that, that I've already mentioned, but I wanna also think about for Hindu activists who are uh, working in the field of, of Hinduism ecology on the ground in action. First, I would say that there is in, the, in the 20 years that have passed since the first gathering here uh, at, at Harvard for the conferences, religion to me has become much more divisive in the world. Uh, so a question arises, is it possible to employ Hindu conceptions and practices successfully in environmental work in a manner that is not alien to India's non-Hindu population? And I think that's just a major question that has to be faced in India. And I give as an example uh, Uma Bharati, who under the Modi administration has been placed as the uh, Minister of Water Resources in India. And she has a past that ties her uh, significantly to a fundamental Hindutva uh, movement in India. She uh, wears saffron clothing. She considers herself a sadhvi, a Hindu renouncer. And um, 
and is a fiery Hindutva activist uh, who is tied to Babri Masjid destruction and such things. So needless to say, her national leadership of river environmentalism uh, is, is just very challenging for non-Hindus in India. So the question is, can there be a more exclusive form of, of environmentalism generated that is not alienated uh, others? And second, I would say that there has to be some um, addressing the issue of the competition and squabbling that often happens uh, amongst various environmental groups. And um, uh, some of us were involved in a, in a uh, conference in uh, Brindavan, a site of one of, uh, kind of an active site of work on the Yamuna River there, and came away, I think, worrying that, um, that uh, some of the particular institutional competition really overshadowed the collective work that they all gathered to do. And there's a time when competition for resources and followers seems to be more important for institutions than the cause itself. And I don't think that's unique to India, but in a way, um, I think that that, that comes up. Um, big, big, there are just big challenges on the horizon. Um, I would say that globalization, which I see as the promotion of um, excessive consumption on the planet, is, is growing. And the question is, how does one really deal with the increasing power of multinational corporations? And I see that happening. India is no different, but the change in India has been so extremely rapid. Uh, when I first went to India in, in uh, 1980, uh, the river, Yamuna River, was clean enough that I comfortably would swim in it for two hours. And uh, by the time of the, the conferences, uh, I was very, very hesitant to do that, and today wouldn't. So just there's a compressed change that has happened there. Um, and, and, and in that sense, India is a good laboratory, I suppose, to... to uh, to study such things. Um, and I, in addition to globalization, the other great, great increase on the planet is the, uh, the level of environmental uh, degradation that we're seeing today. And I think climate change, to kind of just shout that out, we know uh, is, is such a challenge for all of us. So the question is, is how is one going to deal with with uh, the, the um, greater power of, of multinational corporations on the planet and the promotion of excessive con consumption, uh, w while at the same time we see a parallel increase in the threats themselves. So uh, I suppose the big question I just leave, leave us all with is how, how do we deal with the bigger problems that, that uh, are arising? OK, thank you. Now, this panel session is a little bit shorter than the one earlier, so, so it's for us to be aware of that. So we have about 20, or f a little bit more than 15 minutes for questions from the floor. So I'll follow Frank's example and begin on this side. So, Dr. Kavlin, you said no religion is yet ready to face the climate crisis. No one do you think is? Well, the last one was... I think that, I think yeah. Right, just the, I just didn't hear the very last couple words. So you said no religion is ready to face yeah. this climate crisis, which I think is a fabulous statement. So I'm wondering who do you think is ready to face? None of us. So it's, it's something that we're all struggling to deal with in some sense, both conceptually and actually. I think, and I, I don't mean, that, that's not a pessimistic state for me, for me. It just is recognizing that we're not gonna find answers in some explicit, clear way in religious practice or religious scripture. But that's not to say that those aren't valuable resources for us to uh, struggle with, with addressing it. So by that I just mean that um, that, that was uh, in the context of me saying that we can't over romanticize and think that, oh, here's a practice in the past that answers our question. It's a resource for us to utilize and to think with um, but but that's different. Uh, I, and, and that and so I just will repeat in saying that the the um, something like climate change and the environmental challenge we face today is completely unprecedented in the history of our species. Just to follow up, do you think multi faith or interfaith solutions are going to be can, can be? 
I'm, I'm one of thinks the more the better. So yes, I wouldn't want to say no to anything. Uh, interfaith and internal w w developments. I just, uh, I think we've got to look for whatever, whatever works at this point. But um, the one I'm more familiar with, as you know, is the one from Orissa, Jagannath the Temple, to Shakta Tantra. Now, tan Tantrism cross cuts yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. Everything. It goes from Jainism, Sikhism, yeah. Buddhism, uh, and of course, Orissa, uh, Buddhism was the yeah. state religion very late until the 12th century, or something, and got folded into. So what I found there is an extremely, mm. uh, you know, the kind of work you do, extremely this world affirming yeah. the sacredness uh, of the world, and, uh, and both in the elite and the folk, uh, folk practices. Right. And what you think of that? I know the, the, the term tantra elicits wrong ideas in our minds, yeah. but no, it, it, is, it is something that crosses. Yeah. Well, you've mentioned both bhakti traditions and, and tantra. Um, I think the boundary between tantra and bhakti is not firm often. So I think that there is a continuous relationship between the two. I think I could articulate differences. But nonetheless, I think what they both share is a critique of hard boundaries in, in many ways. So um, we might talk about ontological boundaries um, that, that need to disappear in the human relationship with the non-human world, but we can also talk about those social boundaries. Again, I think that those are resources that can be utilized, and certainly in the history of the religious development of, of northern India, um, it's not just Tantra and Bhakti, but also Sufi traditions were so yeah, important yeah. all that, right. No. But it's Islam of a particular type, and that's why you use the word Sufism. I think these are traditions that share a lot, fed each other a lot, um, and that's what I mean by, there's a hardening of boundaries today in, in so many ways. So, uh, yeah, what, what would a Kabir express devotional approach to Hinduism and ecology look like? We can ask the questions, but I suppose the anthropologist in me wants to look for that on the ground and l let's see. I, I, yeah, let's see. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to respond to the Tantra question as well and talk about some um, engaged work that I've done over the years. And having been trained as a Pujari and having learned the grammar that comes out of what we find in Tantra, which is a reverence for earth, water, fire, air, and space, and then retrieving the texts that actually delineate that from the Markandeya Upanishad, from the um, Yoga Vasishta from the uh, Garanda Samhita in the yoga tradition, and then using that as a bridge in training yoga teachers to make more specific the instantiation that's accessible through the practices of yoga. And by linking a progressive elemental dharana and a, a progressive elemental practice, there can be a recovery of a sense of well-being and one of the, the issues that came up earlier is, you know, what can we do with our students? They're always on their video games. And what we do is take them outside and reintroduce them to the elements, not necessarily telling them what we're doing, but in our religion and ecology courses, this, this tantric substructure is really the philosophical context for developing that moment that might happen that William James like to talk about in terms of conversion, so, yeah. Upcoming book. It's <laughs> Are they aware of it? Are they trying to solve it? 
Yeah, for really since the beginning, where if we look at the merchants to whom the Buddha turned for his funding, many of them were Jain. And what happens is that they couple their accumulation with wealth with donation. So the idea is that you make sure that the monks and the nuns are abundantly provided for to the extent that their vows allow. And that extends to networks of homes that the lay people organize and making sure that there will be enough food to go around as they are making their, their trips. And then in terms of their own religious practice, and this is where the Tantra actually eventually becomes part of Jain tradition, is that they um, build these amazing temples. And that... I'm, I'm thinking more of the industrial... And the industrial people, they generally are, are um, not unlike other Indian industrialists in that, yes, there will be low-wage workers, and there will be... I would like to think a little bit more gentleness. They would be the first to say that they're not perfect. And there's always a concern for education. And the Jains operate thousands of schools throughout India that serve mainly non-Jain non populations. So yes, we could do a firm and thoroughgoing social critique of treatment of workers. And we have to also look at the good works that are also performed alongside. See the question, John asked, and then move back away. At, at the risk of um, moving into a, um, a conceptual or being accused of abstracting, I wanted to explore the materialism question, or the sense of new materialism, and looking for a, a language. And I'm really headed towards prana, just to signal my yeah. my uh, endpoint. Uh, say uh, in the East Asian world, it's possible to use the term chi in the classroom, and it's evocative for students to enter into a sense of vibrant matter, or to talk about presence in matter. Mm -hmm. Similarly, in the uh, Maori world, to talk about mana. Uh, these are evocative terms, Manitou in the Ojibwe, or Anishinaabe peoples, uh, thanks to Melissa's good work on Melissa Nelson and others. But I'm wondering, does prana have that charge? Is that a language in South Asia that's uh, helpful for talking about vibrant matter? Um, to speak to that, I would say that's not the term I hear in, the, uh, in, in speaking of people who are really engaged in, in both environmental work as well as um, the, what I'm calling this worshipful interaction with embodied forms of divinity. The term is more swarup. And yeah, prana, and swarup, you know, Srivatsa Goswami, and I've talked with him about these terms a lot, and he likes to translate swarup as presence. So that's why I bring that term up. And the key is in something like whether it be a river, a tree, or a, a stone, is to experience the swarup of that entity. And when you can experience the swarup with that entity, you're, you establish a relationship with it that is not possible without an experience of that presence. Yeah, I'd like to affirm prana, which is certainly abundant in the Upanishads, affirm swarup, which is certainly a keystone of Yoga Sutra, and then add the word jiva, which is the life force that is said to be present in so many multiple expressions. Could be. Yes, <laughs> and I'm reminded of Glenn Smiley. And Glenn Smiley was one of the founders of the Fellowship of Reconciliation. He became very active in Los Angeles following the Rodney King riots and, or uprising, I might say, in 1992. And he went directly into the middle schools and into the lower schools, that particularly he was interested in fourth graders. And he set up uh, role-playing within those classrooms where there would be conflict. 
And then he asked the students themselves, how might they address this in a way other than hitting someone or speaking a negative word? And they came up with some brilliant, insightful ways to be nonviolent. And what he and others have done is really put forward a patterning that we all have emotions, we all need to be in touch with our emotions, we need to recognize that other people have emotions, and we need to find the language to negotiate that. It really goes back, as you know with Rafi, to early childhood education, and as long as that is held forward as an option, Marian Edelman Wright, you know, that was the whole project with early childhood education. Laurel Quaker is nodding her head also. Then I see a lot of positive um, possibility with that. Yeah, just your, your question, um, does it have a place in religion and ecology? I would say it already has in, in this way too. Uh, there are so many ways to answer that question, but in thinking about deep ecology, and uh, that was mentioned in some sense, how I'd like to talk to you about the relationship between shallow and deep. I think, I think it, anyway, we had something to talk about there. Um, that Arnie Nass, the, the so-called founder of deep ecology, was a student of Gandhi, and Ahimsa was so central. So the idea of the, the radical equality comes out of that, that, that all beings have intrinsic value, that Ahimsa, or nonviolence, is, is just the logical outcome of that. And so I'd say deep, and I'm saying deep ecology really embeds, or is embedded in so many of the environmental movements globally speaking. And and I could make the argument that deep ecology is really a form of Vedantic Hinduism applied to the ecological situation, um, and and it comes through Gandhi, who himself makes it very clear that's that's the tradition he's grounded in. But again, not this world renouncing one, but more what's called the evasion of Vedantic traditions that he makes very clear in his writings was his own legacy. So I, I think it's already there, um, both in the academic study of, as well as in the traditions in India. And of course, Rai Chan Bhai, who was a Jain, was deeply influential, right. was his living guru. Yeah. The question in the back a long time ago. Sorry? Did you have a Well, a quick answer would be yes, that danger is there. And the, what you just uh, expressed is really the thesis of Kelly Alley's book on the bank of the, of the Ganga. Um, she and I, when I came out on my, with my book on the Yamna, were called in as a team, often to give presentations together. So I had occasion to talk with her because what I say in my book is that that position, I, I certainly found that in my studies, but I, I tried to make it a bit more complex. And there, it can work both ways, so that there are those who saw a river goddess as, as that all-powerful mother who forgives any dirty naughtiness her children would create. That view is there, and it is expressed in a mother theology. Um, there's another one that has it that, um, that, and she's not affected by it, right? And that's what you're saying, it undermines efforts to cleanse the river. There's another that says that she's not affected by it, but all the beings who depend upon her are, and that for their sake, one should stop polluting the river, right? And then there's a third one that, that uh, acknowledges that she is affected by it, she is ill and dying, and in some cases has already been declared to be dead. Um, so I just think that, that um, 
yeah, dangers there and the other side. And that, that is that it's those latter groups, there are very few who'd say dead, but ill and perhaps dying, are the ones who are most motivated to engage in what we would call environmental activism, more expressed in their cases, seva, as loving service to the mother in that form. One last question. <laughs> Oh, you want to go first? Well, I wouldn't mind just a quick comment. Well, again, I would say the same. That is that the danger is there. But um, I'm trying to think, well, particularly my tree book, the, I, I really end with that question, is because people have a relationship with a particular tree. And when I ask them, you know, why that's the case, a woman would tell me is, look, there are husbands in every family in this town, but the man who lives in this house is my husband. So likewise, this is my tree. So there is a, there's an intimacy and a personal relationship. But I, I end the book on reflection and conversation I had that show that, that when you see the divinity in that one tree, then that expands to all trees and, and finally all of life. And not everyone would take it there. But again, it's not simply a resource that could go in that direction, but I found that that's precisely how at least some people do think of it. Chris, we're just out of time, so when you consume this scarce resource of time, I'm <laughs> Okay, you've asked the perennial philosophical and theological question about the one and the many. And with someone like Acharya Tulsi, he stirs up this big conversation. And the conversation came up, is it only the monks who can become free? And the lay people right in front of him said, because he sort of implied that, and they said, no, 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 we know. No one knows really what goes on with us at the point of death. And the scripture states, and they found this text, and they showed it to me, that even if you're wearing clothes, even if you've <laughs> lived a life as a lay person, if you die into a place of purity, that no, you too can be free. So there was this argument against the hierarchy within that community, which as Varun Soni at USC likes to say about Hinduism is that, you know, we talk about these organized religions. Well, the religions of India, they're just plain <laughs> disorganized religions. <laughs> so please join me in thanking the two guys.